aware of that? It's important to see what the Book of Mormon says and doesn't say. The next mention of weapon making is 200 years later where the Nephites had become rich in gold and silver and in precious things and in fine workmanship of wood, in buildings and in machinery, and also in iron and copper and brass and steel, making all manner of tools of every kind to till the ground and weapons of war. Yea, the sharp pointed arrow and the quiver and the dart and the javelin and all preparations for war. Jerem chapter 1 verse 8. Interestingly, swords are not mentioned here, and the weapons listed could have been made of wood as well as of metal, or with a combination of both, wood shafts with metal tips, for example. Though the passage could mean that the tools and weapons were of iron, copper, and steel, it could also simply mean that the Nephites had the metals mentioned as well as tools and weapons constructed of unspecified metals or unspecified materials actually is how he puts it so you see there is another interpretation of that verse that I have never seen critics consider it's not a necessary conclusion with how the critics are interpreting the Book of Mormon there's another very possible, logical, rational explanation. You see how this is working. It's very important to see that. After 2 Nephi chapter 5, verse 14, the Book of Mormon mentions Laban's sword three times. In Nephi's old age, having wielded the sword of Laban in their defense, that's Jacob 1, verse 10, in a description of King Benjamin's fighting at the head of his armies, see the words of Mormon, chapter 1, verse 13, and in King Mosiah's accession to the throne, where King Benjamin gave him charge of the records, the compass, and the sword of Laban. That's Mosiah 1, 15 through 16. Such use suggests that the weapon was not well known, but also unique wielded by kings with no companion pieces, no comparable pieces, being used by others. Only the king had that type of sword. That's one possible way to interpret the data of the Book of Mormon. Are you beginning to see the issue here? Just because a critic asks a question and then says, this is what it means, ain't necessarily so there could be other ways to interpret the data. That's why it's so important to take the time to study the context and the text. Because if you want a quick, fast problem, bam, 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 you can interpret it that way, sure. But the question is, is that what the text means? On a careful analysis and reading, it might possibly mean something else, literally. So, on the other hand, Nephi may also have written in a general sense here when he says he made the Nephites weapons on the general pattern of Laban's sword a handheld weapon with a double-edged long blade rather than exactly copying the structure and the material of the sword of Laban in every detail. There's another possible reading. He may have used the sword of Laban as a weapon as a pattern for weapons in general. And in a general sense, the Mockawhittle in Mesoamerica has many parallels to a typical sword. Now, the question of metal weapons. Hamblin also discusses that on page 346. On page 346, Hamblin notes there are five explicit references to metal weapons and armor in the Book of Mormon. Two are references to the Near Eastern weapons. The blade of Laban's sword was of the most precious steel. That's 1 Nephi 4.9. And Nephi's bow was made of fine steel. That's 1 Nephi 16.18. The existence of steel, that is, carburized iron weapons in the Near East,
in the early 6th century BC has been clearly demonstrated. Robert Madden writes, to sum up by the beginning of the 7th century BC, at the latest, the blacksmiths of the Eastern Mediterranean had mastered two of the processes that make iron a useful material for tools and weapons, carburizing and quenching. So this is, this is not a problem. Aside from Jerem, chapter 1, verse 8, this leaves two cases of metal weapons, both of which, interestingly enough, are from Jaredite times. The Jaredites did molten out of the hill and made swords out of steel. Ether 7, verse 9. On returning from their expedition into the lands of the Jaredites, this is about 121 B.C. in time, a band of Nephite explorers brought breastplates, which were large, and they are of brass and of copper and are perfectly sound. And they have brought swords, the hilts thereof have perished, and the blades thereof were cankered with rust. This is Mosiah chapter 8, verse 10 and 11. The steel sword episode occurred during the civil war between Shul and Korahor. Although Jaredite's chronology is very uncertain, John Sorensen has tentatively dated this period of Jaredite history to around 2800 B.C., putting it well before the beginning of the Iron Age in the Middle East. So in light of contemporary conditions in Mesoamerica, we can understand this passage in a number of ways. Although the blades of most Makahuitles in Mesoamerica were made from obsidian, the Aztecs were known to have had war clubs studded with iron instead of the usual obsidian. There are even examples in Mesoamerica of ceremonial mockawiddles with feathers replacing the obsidian blades. Various types of materials, including iron, replace the usual obsidian of the mockawiddle, and such a weapon could thus be described as a sword with a metal blade. Another possibility is to equate this Jaredite steel with the steel of the King James translation of the Old Testament, which actually refers to the Hebrew word for bronze. Now we know bronze is not steel, but in the translation of the Bible, they translate it as steel. For us to say it's the modern steel as we understand it, that's the wrong way to read the ancient records. Every historian knows that. We cannot stamp our modern interpretation back onto the ancient texts and make sense of those texts. Finally, we need to understand something else. This is a very important point that Hamblin brings out, too. I never thought of it this way. Neither have any of the critics, obviously. Here's another way to understand this. Mosiah translated Ether's plates into social and linguistic concepts with which he was familiar in 121 B.C. Mosiah, as king, had Laban's sword, a steel weapon that was passed down as one of the insignia of royalty. In translating Ether's record, Mosiah might thus have given the Jaredite kings steel swords like the one he himself possessed thousands of years later in 121 BC, because in Mosiah's society, a king was expected to have a steel sword as his royal weapon. And I've got a note to go to the uh, footnote here, and this is a fascinating footnote also. For a discussion of the various factors involved in Mosiah's translation of the plates of ether, John Welch has discussed that in the preliminary comments of discussions behind the sources for the book of ether. In the Aeneid of Virgil, this is fascinating. For just two examples of anachronistic descriptions of Bronze Age Trojans using iron and steel weapons. References in the Book of Mormons to metals used by the Jaredites may be in part a similar anachronism. Did you get that? Two places in Virgil's Aeneid, at, in, in the Aeneid 2, 333 and 627, they describe weapons of steel and iron. But that's anachronistic. But it's a translation of 
we're dealing with. A translation is only as good as the translator's knowledge and assumptions, you see. This is the issue. This is part of the problem with the Book of Mormon. 